the book of Daniel we're going to do today. The book of Daniel, what does Daniel mean? God is judge. It would seem many people forget this, that God is judge. And certainly um, that uh, being his position, his place, and certainly um, that's what he does. Not man, but Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Now, the book of Daniel is basically the apocalypse of the Old Testament. We have one other apocalypse, one chapter written by Isaiah that we can call the apocalypse, but this is kind of an overlay. As a matter of fact, Christ would mention this in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and he would mention Daniel in Mark, chapter 13, concerning the end times, using him as an example of what would happen right at the very end, that you should be familiar with it. Um, and certainly Ezekiel mentions Daniel three times. Now, you're going to have some higher critics that will say Daniel should never have been canonized. They're ignorant, okay? You know, Scripture lawyers that simply study Scripture for money are not worth the time of day. Uh, Daniel was one of the wisest. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, where it refers to Satan, wiser than Daniel. So this gives you an idea of how wise this lad was. When we pick this up, Daniel will be about 16 years old. Okay, Young lad of the king line. And um, when, when we take the correction in time, it will run about um, uh, 500, I'm going to say 500 B.C., okay, with, with the correction of the kings. And um, so it is. So uh, it's a very important book because it goes into the king of Babylon, which really is a sign and a type of the end times. Having said that, let's get right into the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, K-I-M, King of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And he, he did this, you know. Do you know how he was able to do this? Our Father is in control, and you want to always remember that. God is so very much in control. In Jeremiah chapter, you're not going to have it, but make a note. Jeremiah chapter 27, and don't ever forget it. Verse 6, And now have I given all these lands unto the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. In other words, this was a servant of Almighty God, even though he captured Jerusalem. Even though he took Daniel and others captive, he was still a servant of God, fulfilling that particular role. And the beast of the field have I given him also to serve him. And verse 7, And all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the very time of his land come. And it would. This is the time of the Gentiles. And it continues to this day. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And of course, that would be when the Medes and the Persians would take over, much as you even see Medes and Persians today. Okay. Interesting time that you live in and, and fascinating. But how did Nebuchadnezzar take our people? God's control. God allowed it. And you might say, well, why would he do that? He had a purpose. He warned that you would go into captivity. You know, Father doesn't make idle threats. Verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. He did what? He took him, no, the Lord gave him into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Shinar is really a name for, uh, uh, one name for Babylon. It, it, it means in that tongue two rivers, and it's the Tigris and the Euphrates, okay? And when you look at that Tigris, even to this day, you see a great deal going on there, all right? And 
uh, here, the very vessels of the house of God taken to that place, all right? We'll pick these up a few chapters hence, all right? And um, it's very, very interesting. So, in this land of the two rivers, uh, he goes, verse 3, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, this is the head eunuch, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and the princes. This is to say the nobles, bring me the best, all right? Now, Ashpenaz, why, why, do you know what it means? Horse nose. Now, how in the world did the head eunuch become named horse nose or horse face? And I can only say probably because he looked, he had a face that reminded you of a horse's face, okay? Probably very long. And um, uh, so, uh, there he was. But I want you to know God is going to take over the mind of this person as well as anybody that has effect on these children, uh, these nobles that God will bring of the seed of the seed royal, okay? Verse now, I want you to remember the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes have been in captivity for 200 years at this time. Just now you have Judah coming into captivity 200 years later. Okay. And uh, make, make a note. So there you go. Verse 4. These princes, these nobles, verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability to in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, there were about five dialects of the Chaldean tongue. When we get to chapter 2, as we really steeped and go into the captivity, the language will change. This is pure Hebrew in the manuscripts here. But when we get to chapter 2, in the uh, fourth verse, I think it is, we'll see when we get there, it changes to Syriac or Aramaic. And the book of Daniel will be written in Aramaic, the captive language, the language of the Chaldees, through chapter 7, which are the years of captivity. And then prophetically speaking, prophetically speaking, then at the 8th chapter we go back to pure Hebrew again because it is the prophecies of how we find our freedom at that time. So he picked these uh, youngsters because they were sharp, right? intelligent. Do you know what Nebo means, Nebuchadnezzar from Nebo? It means the God who presides over learning of um, science and letters. So he, he was quite a person. And he will be the author, even the writer of the fourth chapter of this book of Daniel. So you can't relate, even though he is a type of the king of Babylon in the end times, he's still converted. He, he, you, when we get to the fourth chapter, you're going to find one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible given by Nebuchadnezzar to Almighty God, our Father. Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Let's Let's bring them up. And, and now, these were not people who uh, participated in God's health laws, okay? And uh, scavengers would be part of the meal. So, naturally, these children were not accustomed to that type of food. No scavengers, all right? They lived by God's health laws. Verse 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, God is my judge, Hananiah, God's gift, and Mishael, which is to say, who is El, who is God, and Azariah, Azariah being helped 
of God. Help of Yah. Okay. That's what their names were. Verse 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. He changed them. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, that is to say, Bel protect, protect his life, and Hananiah, that's to say, the gift of God, of Shadrach, that means um, the worshiper of the moon god, Akka, and to uh, Mashiel of Meshach, who is Ak, okay, and to Azariah, a Bednego, in other words, who who is Nebo, who is Nigel. Okay, so changing their names to, to Chaldean names. Uh, verse 8, And Daniel uh, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, not going to eat scavengers, nor with wine wh which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. In other words, uh, he stood forth. And made that stand. It kind of reminds you of the old uh, poem, which I always like to quote about this time. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. He made it known that he did not wish to partake of unclean food. That it would make them sick, make them ill. Verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now, I want you to be real careful when you read God's word. Did it say here, Daniel made himself very popular with the, with the uh, head of the eunuchs? Or the head of the eunuchs was very pop thought Daniel was quite popular. That's not what it said. And if, you, if that's what you read from it, you missed the whole point. Let's read it again. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor. In other words, God accomplished it. God's in control. God can control emotions where man can't. You know, many times when, when this compassion and love that God can control. You know, I have seen people in my lifetime in, in counseling um, uh, of um, people whereby you could do everything in your power to try to persuade somebody a certain thing and then pray about it and God could change that person's mind like a, a miracle happened. Okay. Because God can and God is in control. You see, where you fall short, if you take things for granted and don't give God credit, he's not going to bless you. You've got to recognize him, our Father, and do not remove him from the equation of your life. Uh, thank him even for the very air you breathe. He created it. Verse 10, And the prince of the eunuch said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king. This would be Nebuchadnezzar, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse, liking than the children which are your sort? And then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of what the king might say and do here. If you stop eating what he has proposed and, um, and, and you begin looking kind of scrawny, I, I'm going to be in trouble when he finds out. Again, you know, many might just give up right there. No, God's in control. Okay. Eleven. Then said Daniel to Melzar. This is a this just simply means butler, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Verse twelve. Prove thy servants. Let's do this. You prove us. I beseech thee ten days. And let them give us poles to eat and water to drink. Now, I want to instill that when you're delivered up before the king of Babylon, that is to say, as it is written, and we just completed the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, you're going to have tribulation 10 days. Okay. And I, I kind of like to 
think on this and the fact of spiritual food as well. For when you're in the end times, the famine is not for food, but for hearing the word of God. And if, if you do not have that diet of the pure, true word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you're going to come up short. And it could be very uh, damaging to your knowledge and your ability to ascertain as to who is true and who is false, what is truth and what is not. That's why it's so important that you absorb the Word of God. Now, let, let's talk about pulse a minute. It, it is, um, uh, in researching the Word, really, uh, you come down to pods, okay? Now, now pods are beans, lentils, and uh, a great deal of food which has sufficient protein and so forth uh, without going even into scavenger or clean meats. So uh, gaining protein from that. And at best, it does mean clean food. But you could, many people translate it vegetables. Well, that doesn't quite catch it, okay? Because you still come back to the fact that not all vegetables come from pods, you know. Like beans are in a pod. You have to shell them, okay? And so forth. And lentils and so forth, uh, too. Uh, but this is the type of food that they requested. He said, put us on it. Let us try that. Verse 13. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. Now, a lot of people would have difficulty with this, but you can tell many people by what they eat. You can, you can observe them, and it's obvious, okay? Um, and, and I think I won't say a great deal more than that. Verse 14, So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. He, he, uh, why? You might say, well, boy, Daniel must have had some effect on him. No, God did. Don't ever, don't try to take credit away from God or you're in trouble, okay? God arranged it, just as he arranges things in the life of God's elect. Verse 15, and at the end of ten days their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And you take someone that is used to a diet of God's food, and you start, begin feeding them scavengers, they're going to be sick ten days, okay? Literally. Verse 16, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. He allowed it, okay? That's the food that, was, that they were accustomed to. And they thrived quite well upon it. Again, God in control. Verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. These were the sharpest guys, really. Is that what you read? I don't think so. They're sharp, all right. But who arranged it? I'm going to be bearing down a little bit on this through this book of Daniel. What did it say? God gave them. God's in charge. God's in control. This is why I insist when you have difficulty understanding a scripture, what do you do? Pray that God make it clear to you. He will. He can change minds. He can elevate minds. He can guide minds. He's her father. Okay. So don't ever take away. He blessed these four, I mean, tremendously. And especially Daniel. Verse 18, Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. How many, how many days was that? Three years. Okay. So if Daniel was 16 when this started, he would, he would be three years older, now 19. 
as well as the other uh, would-be age. Now, naturally, a three-year span always has a great deal when we get to the king of Babel, and also you want to bear that in mind concerning end times. Verse 19, And the king communed with them, and among them all was found communing, um, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and um, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Why wouldn't it? I mean, you can see that God had his hand on them. And God is in control. He steered those four right where he wanted them, as he always guides his elect. Verse 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. I mean, here you got a bunch of moolahs and magis that uh, have lived off of this king for years pretending. Oh, yes, dear king, I see into the future, and what I see for you is nothing but good. Yeah, I mean... You know, people can make things up to be a Magi. But here you have four that God has his hand on them. He tells them what to say. He leads them before the king of Babylon. Just as the Holy Spirit will speak through your lips when you're delivered up before the king of Babylon of the book of Revelation, that is to say the Antichrist. Our Father is so very precious to us. And Magi and magicians and astrologers, they can look off in the sky and say, King, I see many things coming your way. I see stars. Well, if he'd have popped him a good one right up beside the head, he might have seen more stars than that. Okay, but anyway, um, uh, frauds show up in times of uh, crisis, all right? Daniel um, and uh, his, the other three, they're not frauds, okay? Ten times better in accuracy in reporting. So the religious community, uh, even though our Heavenly Father had his hand upon them, and he made them shine. How popular, I want you to just think about this, how popular do you think that makes this four among that religious community? your magi and your astrologers and your magicians, they're going to be about as popular as a hare and a biscuit, okay? Which, uh, that, that's an old southern terminology of being not very welcome, okay? And God actually leading, though, and protecting, that's what counts. That's what brings the blessings. 21, and Daniel continued even until the first year of King Cyrus. That would be about, when, when we take the 110-year correction um, on, on the um, chronological order of events, that makes this somewhere between 495 and 426. So that would be 69 years okay, longer that uh, this would transpire. Cyrus, of course, uh, was named, surnamed by God. God gave him his name before he was ever born. And Cyrus, of course, would be one of the ones that truly delivered and brought into being the captivity of the city again, in part. Not, not, the, the, um, not the dome itself, that is to say the rock. So here we have Daniel... Have he, here he was taken captive. And I want you to think about this. Daniel will become third in the kingdom. I mean, he's going to be really elevated and put over. I want you to go all the way back in your mind to Joseph, if you would, who his own brethren sold him into captivity, and he went into Pharaoh's camp and was elevated in Pharaoh's camp to where he'd become also treasurer and was over much of the land and was able to save his brethren, the sons of Israel, all right, the tribes of Israel. And here we see Daniel himself is going to be elevated 
And Daniel will even save the lives of this Magi before it's over with because they're about to get in a bind. There will be events transpire that they can't handle. And God will touch Daniel and he will bloom forth. Uh, chapter 2, let's go a verse or two. Chapter 2, verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherein his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. I mean, it really frightened him. It shook him, too. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers. This is the druggies, all right? In the Greek, we would call it pharmaceutica, which means drugs. Our word pharmacist comes from it. And the Chaldeans, that's to say of the, of the other sort, for to show the king his dreams, so they came and stood before the king. Now, the king cannot absolutely remember what he dreamed. All he knows is he had a dream that shook his boots. Okay? That really, I mean, it just, he just jarred him awake. He wants to know. Verse 3, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. I want to know it. I want to understand it. Now, here is where we switch from Hebrew to Aramaic in the middle of this next verse. Now, I will point out when. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, or Syriac being Aramaic. Okay. Okay, so with the word O, we go into Chaldee, and it will stay there all the way through the seventh chapter. Just letting you know, Daniel knew the language pretty well. Okay. Syriac. He took advantage of those three years had he not known part of it before because of the captivity, which I'm sure he knew, knew in part. But here, he absorbs, did Daniel do this? No, God assisted him, and he did it. O king, this is what the magicians say. O king, live forever. That's a good compliment, okay? Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. We'll make something up. Yep. We'll make it fit. You just tell us what it is that you dreamed. Now, we've got a problem. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't remember what he dreamed. But Nebuchadnezzar, because of what he's paid these dudes, he expects them to be true magicians and astrologers seeing the future to tell him what it was he dreamed. Well, if you don't have God as a gift, you'd be hard placed, all right? So, here we continue then in the Aramaic language. Five, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. I mean, he's a little bit disturbed here. That here he's had these people on his payroll all these years, and they can't help him. No help whatsoever here. This may plant a seed in your mind of how Nebuchadnezzar in the fourth chapter is going to convert to serving Yahweh. And, you know, because he's seen the power, he observed the power that God gave Daniel or assisted him and the uh, three children. Six. And if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're just a common being and God's not assisting, that's impossible. Okay. Wouldn't, wouldn't do to make something up here and be caught because they don't know for sure whether Nebuchadnezzar has forgotten what he dreamed or he will recall it if they start making something up, they're in a hard spot. Verse 7, 
They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. That's what we're in the business of, is making stuff up. You, you want to think about this in the religious community considerably, my friend. You want to listen to what God has to say, not traditions of men from Magi down through the years with flyaway doctrines and easy outs rather than serving God as you're supposed to, as Daniel did. Again, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. God's Word is to be made known. And God, through Daniel, is making, assisting Daniel in making that stand. Now, at the same time, where Nebuchadnezzar has pronounced this, Daniel and the three children are considered to be in that category, so this cut in pieces applies to them as well. If somebody doesn't come up with the vision, the dream, they're going to all be killed, okay, including Daniel. So um, they are, incidentally, they are all in kind of a hard place. Okay, let's go on with the next verse, verse 8. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time. I know what you're trying to do because you see the thing is gone from me. You know, I, I can't tell. Verse 9. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. You, you show me the dream, and I'll know, and I will believe your interpretation. Otherwise, I'm going to know you're going to do just like you have in the past. You're going to make up a bunch of malarkey. All right, I add the word malarkey, but that's what he's implying, okay? He said, you're, you're just trying to gain time. Um, this, this becomes quite serious. We'll pick it up in the next lecture. And again, you're going to see God's intervention. I don't know, does God intervene in your life occasionally when you really need him? Do you ask him? That's what you have to do, you know. Let him know you love him, that you are his child and you wish his protection. You like his leadership, his guiding you. Do you talk to him? You know, he's very real and he can change emotions of people. Even, even sometimes your enemy, he can change their emotions. He's such a wonderful father. Be sure and let him know you love him because he is in charge.